Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace, blessings, and mercy of God Almighty be upon you all. In alhamdulillahi wa salatu wa salamu wa ala asulilahi wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Amma ba'd. Today, inshallah, I wish to give a little bit of a background about myself and an understanding of how it was that I came from a Catholic background into embracing Islam. Basically, my background is that my father, he comes from Italy, and my mother, she comes from an Irish background. And for those who would know anything about these two countries, they are both uh, a Catholic majority country. Basically, for anybody who's wondering, the Catholics are a subsect of Christianity. So you have the religion which is known as Christianity, and then you have many different divisions within Christianity. The largest sect of the Christian religion is the Catholics. Now the word Catholic itself means those who are correct. So the Catholic group within Christianity, they are the largest, they are the majority group. And the word Catholicism itself means those who are following that which is correct. So of course there is a self-claim that they are the ones who are following the true form of Christianity. What is the major thing which separates the Catholics that most people would know is they follow a man who is known as the Pope. Now the Pope, he is seated at a place called St. Peter's Basilica, which is in the Vatican City. The Vatican City is a small country which is located within Rome in Italy. Now this place is an independent state which is essentially the seat of Catholicism. It is 0.44 square kilometers. It's very, very small. If anyone has seen it before, you would know you could walk around it in a matter of minutes. And this is the place which holds the burial place of St. Peter, who was the first of the popes of the Catholic religion. Now a pope, for us Muslims, we might think of it as something strange because the role of a pope is someone who is the head of the religion and it's also believed that he is infallible. So he's not somebody like a caliph or a khalifa as the Muslims have, who is simply a head of the religion and a head of the political state. Rather, the pope is not the head of any political state but rather he is a religious leader and his people look unto him for divine guidance. For they believe that he is God's elect on the earth and whatever he says is infallible, which means he is without mistake. Whatever he says must be followed and it is declared to be the word of God. Now, you could understand that growing up as a Catholic, we would look at this person as the Pope as being someone who is divinely guided, someone who is without error. So once you look into the history of Catholicism, you look at how the popes sometimes were not uprighteous people, rather they were very wicked people. They were people who would contradict each other. They would say one thing and then the next pope would say another thing. And essentially this is therefore claiming that God is saying one thing and then changing his mind on another matter. So growing up looking at these things, especially myself, I would always wonder, can we really call this man infallible? But one of the bases of the Catholic belief is that we accept this and we do not argue with this. So when I came across this, I said, well, I don't want to touch on it because if I say anything against it, this is in effect blasphemy. It is a form of disbelief and you will therefore be excommunicated, which means you are no longer considered part of the Catholic Church. So if you speak to Catholic people, essentially they are supposed to be holding strong to this doctrine. They are therefore supposed to believe that this man is their elect from God. He is their representative. Now this is a problem for many Catholics as it was for someone like myself. Now looking therefore at this Pope and the role that he has and where he's from, this place which we call the Vatican City in Rome in Italy. I was fortunate enough to visit this place in the year 2000 and coming from a non-Muslim background, someone who believed that our religion was correct and essentially all people who are following a religion other than Islam they were being told that their religion is correct. If they have a faith in this religion, they would be adhering to it, which means they do have something of a belief in it. So when I went there, I was under the impression that we were the right people. We were the chosen people. We were the ones who had the right beliefs and we were the ones who would be saved from the hellfire and entering into the paradise. And of course, at this time, I knew nothing about Islam. I knew very little. So going to the Vatican, it was like a Muslim who is going for Hajj. He's going to the place which he sees as being central to his religion. So when I had actually entered into this place, into the Vatican City, from there, the wonders began, the surprises began. I saw that this place which I was entering was something which was actually quite foreign to me because growing up in a Catholic family, I read through the Bible. I went to all of the classes, the religious classes that we had at our primary school. And the lessons that I took 
was somewhat different to the beliefs of the Catholic Church in that we were always taught that there was such a thing called the Trinity and we were taught in something called the Divine Incarnation. Now this word Divine Incarnation, it's fancy words that a little kid would never understand. What it basically means is that the Catholics and the Christians believe that God became a man. He, the Divine, which is God, became incarnate, which means He became a man on this earth. And therefore they believe that God gave His self, meaning that God was killed, to sacrifice for humanity. If I was told this forthright, it would have been something which I would have clearly rejected. But when they use these obscure terms like Trinity, Incarnation, the Divine Ascension, things which are really a little kid wouldn't understand. You just accept it blindly. But in my heart, I always said, there can only be one God. And God is not a man. God is someone who could not be conceived. And this understanding was actually one which was taken from the very Bible, which we all used to read. We would see in the commonly well-known, the Ten Commandments. The first of which is believe in God alone. The second is do not make false images of your Lord. Do not make idols of your Lord. Do not make anything which resembles your Lord basically meaning do not make pictures of your Lord. So when I had actually entered into the Vatican City, this was one of the things which amazingly bothered me because within the Vatican, there is an area which is called the Sistine Chapel. Now this Sistine Chapel, it was painted by one of the great Renaissance painters and he had covered the whole ceiling of this chapel with images of the story of creation from when God had created the prophet Adam, who was the first of the men, peace be upon him. Now looking at this Sistine Chapel, it's not just something which is nice pictures, but rather it is sending messages. It's telling you what are the doctrines of the church of which this was painted upon. If you were to enter into there, first you would see when you look up many beautiful colors. And when you look at the central piece in the Sistine Chapel, there is an amazing picture, something which really confused me when I first saw it because of this belief I had in the Bible because I strongly believed you could not create images of God. And this was something which I thought all of the Catholics were following. However, when you see this central image, you see that there is a man. He's a very old man. You can tell this because he has a long flowing beard and he's resting upon a cloud. And on this cloud, he is surrounded by many angels who are in the form of young boys with wings. And of course, we know that this is not a true representation of what the angels look like. It is something which they are far from. They are not little boys. They are not prepubescent. They haven't got glowing faces and tiny wings like a little cupid. But the thing is, the main thing which really captures you and the thing which you sort of wonder and you can say, how can this be? Around this, this old man, you are told, is supposed to be a representation of God himself. When I first saw this, I said, how can you say that this is an image of God? How can you tell me that this old man here is the person I've been worshipping all my life? Never once have I pictured him in my head. And even after I saw that, I never said to myself, this is God, or that is supposed to be the representation of God. So when the person sees this, the right-minded Catholic or the right-minded person, because anybody would look at this and say, this is a representation of a human. And this human could not have seen God. Because we know even the Bible makes comment of this. It says, nobody has seen God before. And we as Muslims, Alhamdulillah, praise be to God, we also, we are forbidden to make images of God. And we know that none could ever even begin to get a slight comparison of God, who is almighty and above this, above all of these things which are attributed to him. So when the person sees this, when I saw this, I looked at him and I said, this is something which is truly not correct. Even to draw the pictures of Adam or to draw the pictures of Jesus, peace be upon him, you would see over time they would slightly change and nobody would say, well, this is definitely how Jesus looked. Rather, we would say this is just an artistic interpretation. And we know that artistic interpretations are always bound by politics. They are always bound by social factors. So you would see that if you would go into the Arab world, we would see a Jesus who appears more Arabic in his features. If we were to go down into certain areas in Africa, we might see a darker Jesus. Or from the effect of the colonial powers, from the Europeans who went into Europe, they would have a very European looking Jesus, trying to subdue the population by saying, this is your so-called Lord, this is your Messiah, and he is one of us and he's not one of yours. So these images which they draw, it is not just an image, rather it has very, it's very packed with meaning and it's very packed with an interpretation that goes along with it. And the image that was created of God in the Sistine Chapel is something which is no different from this. Because when you see it, 
you begin to say, this is an image which I've seen before, especially this was something that I said. I said, this looks familiar, but I can't really put a pin on it exactly what it is. And it wasn't until some time after, when I began to do my research, and this was actually after I had embraced Islam, that I realized that this picture that they had drawn of God was exactly the same as the picture in which you would see of the ancient Roman gods. And it was also the ancient Romans took their religion from the ancient Greeks. And therefore all of these things were transported into the Catholic faith. Inshallah, we will stop here for a short break and we will continue this discussion in a minute or so, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.